Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Pauline Rankin, Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Welcome to our faculty's Mars and LaFrance lecture and a very special welcome to those in our virtual audience who may be joining us from beyond the Carleton community today. Let me begin with an acknowledgement that the land on which we meet today is the unceded, unsurrendered traditional territory of the Algonquin Nation. This acknowledgement includes recognition of the ways in which our continued presence on this land has contributed to upholding colonialism and signals also our commitment to anti-racist and anti-oppressive education and action. While this is our second virtual edition of the Marcel France lecture, today's event has a long history dating back to the establishment of the Marcel Le France uh, Fellowship in 1979. That fellowship was created by the faculty in memory of Marcel Le France, former professor of English and Dean of Arts at Carleton University. Each year, our faculty holds a competition for the Marcel Le France Fellowship, which includes a full teaching release to allow the recipient to complete a major piece of scholarship. A condition of the fellowship is that the recipient presents a seminar or public lecture on some aspect of the research undertaken as part of the award. Which brings us to today's lecturer, Professor Mark Anderson, the 2021 Marcel LaFrance Fellowship holder. Dr. Anderson is a professor of history who joined Carleton quite recently in 2018 from the University of Regina, where he had taught for the previous 16 years. His PhD is in Latin American history from the University of California, Riverside. He is the author of multiple books, including in 2001, Pancho Villa's Revolution by Headlines, in 2007, Cowboy Imperialism and Hollywood Film, in 2011, the award-winning Seeing Red, A History of Natives in Canadian uh, Newspapers, co-authored with Carmen Robertson, and his most recent book, Holy War, Cowboys, Indians, and 9-11, published in 2016. Today's lecture will focus on one of his current projects, A History of Zombies, with a particular focus on what Richard Slotkin has termed, quote, regeneration through violence, end quote. The lecture is entitled, Zombies and the Death of Certainty in the Land of Perennial Rebirth. And the faculty may need a separate award for most creative lecture title for uh, today's, uh, today's contribution. Before Mark begins, a couple of housekeeping matters. Uh, please mute yourselves and keep your cameras off during the lecture. Feel free to post your questions in the chat function for the Q&A following the lecture that will be moderated by Carol Payne. Mark, welcome, and the floor is yours. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Pauline. Uh, and hi out there. Thanks for tuning in today, wherever you may be. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge several people who made this talk possible today. The first, of course, is Emma Fraser in the Dean's Office, who has a reputation for excellence, and uh, we really put this all together. So thanks for all your help, Emma. Second, uh, graphic designer Ainsley Coghill created that fabulous poster for this event. I really love it. And thanks for, I want to say thanks very much, Ainsley, for that. I also received help and some instruction from the library. Susan Tudin and then Val Critchley. Val explained what I would characterize as YouTube's unkind, at least to me, copyright practices. Uh, anyway, thanks for call, clarifying things, Val. What this means is that you will not see many images today, which is a bit of a shame. I mean, I can use uh, film stills in class, which I do, and employ film stills in the book to come uh, as well, but I can't use them on YouTube. Uh, these are YouTube's rules, so I don't quite get it, but you know, given the bunch of us here today, nobody's going to strike it rich, but whatever, no use griping about it. After all, I'm really happy to be here, delighted to have had time that the Marston and the France Fellowship has offered. I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And in fact, I'm great, also grateful uh, to the History Department for Green to take me on three years ago when I showed up on, at their doorstep. Okay, so here's what I propose to share with you today. The book project is a work in progress. Presently nine chapters, uh, rough summaries of which I'm sharing with you on the PowerPoint as it clicks its way through. My expectation is the book will be completed uh, sometime soon, but hopefully, hopefully in May. So the PowerPoint today will include a sort of working rough guide to the nine introduction and then the subsequent chapters as much as I could reasonably cram in there as you'll notice by chapter onto a given 
page on the PowerPoint, uh, basically, and interspersed with a small handful of public domain images I was able to secure, uh, as well as what I hope are timely passages that I've employed from other scholars, which are mostly taken, as I mentioned, from the introduction. And so finally, then I'm going to read something from the introduction, uh, likely to be a bit choppy. I mean, it seems like that's where every book project begins. And before you're finished, you're still working on the introduction. At least that's, that's certainly my story. So for about a century and a half, the Western has comforted audiences by containing the savage other, often playfully, even comically. That includes a little more than a century of Hollywood film and about 70 years of television. Scholars beginning prominently with Henry Nash Smith in 1950 have traced its origins to the frontier myth, settler America's creation story that dates to the earliest days of English invasion in the 1600s. Yet after dominating prime time since the day of the Puritans, the Western genre that channeled this myth, the canvas upon which America etched its so termed manifest destiny and the newer term, uh, espied exceptionalism, faded after 1968, the high point at which the Vietnam War began to undo the Johnson presidency in the United States. Now, this is important, it seems to me, because I believe that it signifies a kind of death of certainty or of a constellation of certainties caught up in the so termed culture war today. Sometimes that's pluralized as culture wars. Put simply, this war or wars have to do with the legacy and suitability of ongoing white supremacy in the United States, which also includes age old misogyny, which have held uh, in fits and starts since the days of the Puritans, forged in the nation building attempted annihilation of indigenous peoples and reified through the horrors of the institution of slavery. Embedded within these cultural projects lie the, what I'm calling the, these established truths, loosely though decisively prominent also in the frontier myth and have been engaged by the basic question, by the, uh, pardon me, have been engaged by the basic question posed by the zombie horror subgenre, which made its debut in 1932's White Zombie. And that question is, what happens when containment fails? And so that's the basic matter I exploit, explore in this uh, project in nine chapters. Really should have coffee in there, not water. The Western provided the panoramic scape upon which America, settler America dreamed and ultimately commodified itself to wax an old trope. It is the tapestry by and upon which settler America wove itself into existence. This fabric has been fraying for decades. The recent US election, in fact, the entirety of the Trump presidency brought it to the fore. At any rate, I mean, everybody rightly has an opinion about it, of course, and they tend to vary sometimes sharply. And again, as we've seen just recently and ongoing for that matter in the United States. Old fashioned cowboy style containment, to borrow a Cold War phrase, has increasingly appeared to fail to keep the other at bay. Indeed, this is measurable and accessible before our very eyes on screen. Films since White Zombie, but TV shows too since 9-11 in particular, have asked a simple, yet sharply disruptive, though frequently entertaining question, what happens when the other breaks through the imagined proverbial gates? And one answer is zombies. Now, you might ask, why would zombies want to do that? And I think the answer lies in the nature of the zombie as other. They don't really want to do anything, do they? Rather, they're compelled to act because they have, in the worst instances, no self-control whatsoever. The Western triumphantly contained this mythically wrought creature, this other a grab bag of stereotyped attributes that stood in simple binary opposition to the ways in which white settler America imagined itself where settler culture understood itself as male and strong, for example, the other was necessarily conceived of as feminine and weak, where the settler American was honest, the other was dishonest, where the American exemplifies a hard work ethic, the other is lazy, where the American is ruled by rationality, the other is driven by id-like impulses, 
that surface in a spied love of wanton savagery, sexual licentiousness, capricious violence, and so on. I mean, I could go on, but I'm sure you know these attributes as well as I do. You'll know too that these are also the basic characteristics of the zombie, slow, that is slow of thinking and locomotion, lacking judgment, driven not by the mind, but by unfathomable and uncontrollable bodily demands, cannibalistic and so on. The zombie in short is in popular culture, the classic American other in thinly deracialized gays. Uh, gays, guys. Uh, this idea is not original to me, of course, but my particular interest lies in considering how these images speak to the settler nation's creation story, its frontier myth. On the surface, the Western and the zombie sub-horror genre, that's a mouthful, uh, may appear to share little in common. I mean, in general terms, for example, Westerns have been set in post-bellum, that is post-1865 America, west of the Mississippi, and feature white heterosexual male heroes conquering and otherwise performing in ways that reinforce their controlling agency and well, every, pretty much everybody else. In the early days, these others were typically indigenous people, but then also included African-Americans and then later Latinos, especially Mexicans for obvious reasons, uh, given the border, and then still later Central Americans of mestizo or indigenous origins, then Eastern European immigrants, Chinese immigrants, and still later Nazis and communists. And the spoiler alert here is that, oh my God, the other could be shockingly white. And then even later Vietnamese and what we live with today, Arabs with conflated Muslims and a kind of indistinct mashup uh, and occasionally aliens and always, always females of any origin. The Western was exceptionally popular in Hollywood, and you have to be a certain age, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm even quite that age to appreciate just how it dominated um, uh, screens in the 20th century, at least till about 1970 or so. So the Western was exceptionally popular in Hollywood from early days until about 1970. And then in television, it dominated in the 1950s and remained widely popular as recently as the later 1960s. Zombie screen narratives, meanwhile, commenced in Hollywood, as I mentioned, in 1932, flourished briefly, then mostly went underground. Thanks to George Romero, they returned with sudden new urgency in 1968, and since have tended to spew monsters in the form of reanimated corpses with an insatiable hunger for human flesh, plotted in recent decades, often in contemporary and sort of at the same time, uh, post-apocalyptic settings. And yet, barely scratch these surfaces and the genres exhibit at least five similarities that I explore in the book and would like to share with you today. So both, for example, pit civilization against its perceived absence. In the Western, this is traditionally meant non-male and non-white. Our hero, in other words, is generally cast as an adorable, a lethal hetero male garden variety white supremacist. These Western avatars owe their existence and cultural allure to the frontier myth, which argues that the experience of frontier living on the ever shifting wild and Western borderlands, that line or region separating imagined civilization from savagery strips the man of his sissified European culture and rebirths him well as say think uh, early, well not early, but perennial John Wayne or Gary Cooper or the early, in particular, early Clint Eastwood. In Westerns, such men are in command and they come from somewhere specific. An American Westerny dreamscape understood to be blessed by God. This idea is crucial foundational for the myth. So before moving to the second point, let me just say a few more words about the frontier myth. All nations have creation stories. America's frontier narrative blends the historical settling of the land by white invaders with a Protestant tinged interpretation of what that process meant and continues to mean. It's important to remember having said this, that myth is never fixed precisely nor met without contestation. Ironically, this affords it flexibility 
well, maybe not ironically, but at any rate, it affords it flexibility, malleability, and durability. At its core, the American tale centers on white male heterosexual immigrants of European origin moving to the liminal Western wilds, borderland understood as the quote, meeting point between savagery and civilization, according to Frederick Jackson Turner, the prominent 19th century influencer and author of the most commonly cited articulation of the myth. I wanna stress this up front. I'm gonna talk about Turner a bit, but I wanna stress up front, Turner neither invented the myth nor does he own it, but he wrote it down and well, at the very least, you, you know how historians and other academics love written records. Frederick, historian Frederick Pike noted that the gist of Turner's essay, quote, could have been written virtually any time between the 1620s and the 1880s. Turner put pen to paper in 1893. Now, once at the frontier, a term that serves both as a noun and verb in this most famous and enduring of American historical essays. Once on the frontier, says Turner, and countless novelists, I mean, as again, he doesn't own it, but uh, so countless novelists, script writers, filmmakers, uh, the folks at Philip Morris that created the Marlboro cigarette advertising campaign and others, uh, anyway, which was habitually set somewhere in the West, a line or zone that shifted ever more toward the Pacific Ocean. This man faced either certain death or the more desirable outcome, systematic stripping of all his cultural baggage. Now, now this might strike you as ludicrous because in a sense it is ludicrous, uh, I'll get to that. Uh, but perhaps it almost, it seems commonsensical too. But all, at the very least, it's a kind of wish fulfillment. Turner said that the frontier was quote, at first too much for the man. So the two options that presented themselves, one is noted is that he died, or two, as the fates would allow, in order to survive, he was stripped of his cultural baggage and reborn as an American first man, a kind of Adam, or reborn as a, as a, as a Jesus. Think Shane or dances with wolves. So you might object to the apparent sleight of hand. For example, how is this being someone new if fashioned by hand-me-down culture? Never mind that. Myths are stories constructed upon and glued together by emotion rather than reason, though it may be said, they may be said to express emotional reasoning. At any rate, what was innovative and in a sense newfangled was the setting and the application of old ideas to neoteric lands, as well as a firm rejection of the past. According to the myth, such stripping down would fully rinse the man of the desultory flavors and affects of Europeanness. In fact, it turned on its head the commonplace notion that life in the colonies weakened the colonist, rendered such a man morally and even physically flaccid. The frontier myth boldly turns this idea on its head. Scraping away so much European cultural junk instead was a good thing, a necessary thing. It was necessary both to survival and chalk one up for the persistence of Christian ethics, moral improvement, but it gets better because now something truly magical occurs and that is rebirth. Rebirth ensues according to Turner's famous essay, quote, from east to west, we find a record of social evolution. Further, he wrote, the frontier is the line of most rapid and effective Americanization. The wilderness masters the colonists. It finds him a European in dress, industries, tools, modes of travel and thought. It takes him from the railroad car and puts him in the birch canoe. It strips off the garments of civilization and arrays him in the hunting shirt and the moccasin. In short, at the frontier, the environment is at first too strong for the man. He must accept the conditions which it furnishes or perish. The fact is, Turner writes, that here is a new product that is American." End of that long quote. So this proffers a brilliant and heartfelt repackaging of a notion scholars have dated to the Puritans. An alternatively plain, yet metaphorically heavy prose, I think that no graduate student could get away with today, Turner champions America, you know, from 
James Fenimore Cooper's leather stocking tales to, I'm gonna talk a bit more about presidents later on. Uh, to Andrew Jackson, the latter of whom lauded the West as, quote, mercifully free from the influence of European ideas and institutions, end quote. And Puritans who believed, quote, believed that Satan ruled the wilderness areas of the world and its inhabitants, end quote, observes Richard Hughes in his book, Myths America Lives By. In this way, old glory was simply the reductionist outcome of violent frontier experience. But no, it was more than that, Turner argued. The settler nation, that is, the proverbial land of second chances has re been reborn time after time on or by fighting and defeating perceived savages on the frontier. And then by taming the wild landscape, uh, sort of per Genesis 126 upon which the struggle after all had been waged. This epic narrative does not, of course, as I mentioned, belong to Turner, though he is its principal conduit. It is a work of shared imagination that Turner gave voice to as per Benedict Anderson's imagined community. But Turner, again, did not invent anything, but he stamped it with scholarly authority, which was another relatively new mythical development, but he pays the mortgage. He creatively channeled longstanding notions dating to the first European invaders. His genius was to tell people what they already knew to be true. And his endorsement of colonialism was pitch perfect, in part by averring that it was God's own will that it be so, just to quickly observe, in addition to the frontiersman cast as an Adam or Jesus character, the West is framed as an American Eden, reminiscent of that line from John Ford's 1962, and I think this is floating through on the, the PowerPoint as well, line from the man who shot Liberty Valance, we took, where the character Halley says, we took a desert and turned it into a garden. The point is that God chose America, which was music to the air, ears of settler American Christians. And the frontiersman is the animate outcome. You know him. He's predictably polite and maybe even self-effacing, possibly rescues cats stuck in trees, helps little old ladies cross the street. His visage is that of Avatar's Jake Sully, Tarzan of the Apes, Star Wars Han Solo, Dancers with Wolves, John J. Dunbar, or any number of Gary Cooper films beginning with the Virginian. He's kind, he's beautiful, he's sexy, and he's ever so dangerous. Perhaps Turner's most famously quoted lines include these inspirational words, quote, to the frontier, the American intellect owes its striking characteristics, that coarseness of strength combined with acuteness and inquisitiveness, that practical inventive turn of mind quick to find expedience, that masterful grasp of material things lacking in the artistic but powerful to effect great ends, that restless, nervous energy, that dominant individualism working for good or for evil, and with all that buoyancy and exuberance which comes from freedom. These are the traits of the frontier or traits called out elsewhere because of the frontier, end quote. And what he's referring to in the, that last bit is that you didn't necessarily have to be stripped down as long as you might be mentored in a sense by the wave upon wave of this process as it spread east to west across the United States and frontiersmen was, were, were kind of kicked out of the process or up, up from the process. And so according to Turner, proto-Americans poured westward and birthed America, cleansed of unmanly Euro rubbish and reborn, they kindled the nation wave upon wave upon wave. Now here stood the mythical frontiersmen from whom we might derive model cowboys, soldiers, every action hero you've ever seen in, Hollywood, in a Hollywood film, uh, even presidents. Indigenous people did not count or they would have already been reborn in this manner since Turner, Turner claims the process is universal. African-Americans did not count. Greed and the interpretation of scripture saw to that, and females did not count for, well, for similar reasons. In this way, the myth simply countenances, as it likewise candies, the most banal of American cultural endeavors, the championing, championing and ferocious defense of hetero 
white male invasion and control. So here's where the myth gets messy. If, if it doesn't strike you as messy enough already, well, clearly settler America was effectively fashioned by white settlement. It's important to note that the frontier myth is empirically mistaken on every major point. I raise this not to play gotcha with Turner, but instead to underscore the deep emotion resonance that cult, uh, creation myths give rise to. As much as I endeavor in this project to understand the myth in historical context as I've done in two other books, I also stand in awe of its durability. And so I guess at some level, I, I can't quite believe it. So I'm taking a third and hopefully final run at it. Okay, now a quick word or two about Turner's inaccuracies. They substitute for empirical reality in popular culture, and certainly they do in Hollywood film. Whereas in reality, and according to any of the leading introductory American history textbooks used in colleges and university in the United States, history 101 in the United States today, immigrants mostly moved westward together lugging along friends and family, and importantly, dragging American culture with them. They didn't go off as individual white dudes conquering, dying or conquering the wilderness and then being reborn. That didn't happen. Uh, this reflected simple sound judgment given the practical challenges posed by the West. So yes, even if one grants that the frontier may have from time to time been too much for the man, as Turner had it, that is why overwhelmingly he went westward as part of a group a movement, a family, a flood, a flood ultimately that could not be held back despite the efforts, oddly enough, of the early presidents. They were surely influenced by the experienced, these folks, but they were not reborn and not fashioned as mythical frontiersmen or Hollywood cowboy types. Additionally, the West was never empty any more than the East had been empty. Indigenous people owned it and had occupied it for millennia. White immigrants in the West tended to view Indians, the term used in the United States, uh, as whites viewed African-Americans, that is to say, not fully human. The result was that whites settlers judged the West to be empty, empty of civilized beings, that is, uh, as Turner did. And therefore the land was understood to be right for the take. There also exists no evidence of the stripping of culture on Turnerian terms let alone corresponding imaginary rebirth. Had that been the case, it would have happened also in Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, Mexico, and so on. But it did not happen, it did not happen anywhere. And you may note in passing that each of these countries, by the way, have also been plagued by anti-Indigenous racism and remain troubled by colonial policies. Instead, immigrants to the American West tended to be more or less already Americanized and consequently brought American culture, including democracy, with them. Nonetheless, the frontier myth has long been and remains deeply relevant because it served and continues to serve as the commonly understood story that forged the United States. It's meta-narrative, beginning with the early, or pardon me, with the Puritans in the early 1600s and has symbolically rebirthed America ever since. It has, quote, had at its heart the Judeo-Christian rejection of nature and nature's God. Our national myths require too many concessions to permit of accumulation, ownership, and control, writes Gregory Fitzer. Andrew Stephenson has traced manifest destiny from Puritan theology that stamped itself on the emergent set the nation. This is Ste uh, Stephenson. Quote, its origins lay directly in the old biblical notions recharged through the reformation of the predestined redemptive role of God's chosen people in the promised land, providential destiny revealed. The word as God's manifestation in history as predetermined destiny had been ideological staples of the strongly providentialist period in England between 1620 and 1660, during which, of course, the initial migration to New England took place, end quote. As a result, while na nature, the land, quote, must be metaphorically cast as an obstacle to be overcome, a stream to be forded, a prairie to be fenced, and a native people to be annihilated. That's Gregory Fitzer again. In other words, while it is factually mistaken, it is also culturally spot on. 
in much the same way that religion is accurate because people believe, which is precisely the power of myth and its nation building quality. One can then see why the Western has been so closely identified with the myth because in important ways they overlap. Okay, to get back on track, the second of the five similarities, both genres tend to frame American imperialism as its own opposite. Put simply, this entails waging defensive war on the other, characterizing the conflict as one prompted or started or initiated by the other. This is a gambit central to the frontier myth and the Western. In popular culture, these are performances typically expressed in tales in which America has to fight a defensive war to gain control of territory that imagined destiny obliged it to redeem for its own uses, needs, and pleasures, as well as to please God, but possibly also because they had already pleased God, and now with a little bit of mopping up, his chosen ones will take it, take it for themselves and they'll take it from there, in effect. And so he's helping, God is helping to get that win. This is embodied in the common assertion, for example, that indigenous people started the fight in the United States, which was true the Vietnam War and weapons of mass destruction after 9-11, right? The Mexican War of 1846 uh, to 48, they started it. In each case, there, there are more examples of this. That's another story for another day. Mixed it with, up with a kind of Rudyard Kipling-esque wail about the white man's burden. You might call it defensive imperialism, not unlike the Bush Doctrine that allegedly protected America from terrorism. Nothing is more American than the right of self-defense after all, even if it requires preemptive assaults. This is an interesting segue, uh, by the way, it violates, as I take this up in chapter nine, it violates Gene Autry's famous cowboy code wherein the cowboy must never draw first. As a side note, it's, it seems almost bizarre how some of the ideals of the liberal consensus seem almost quaint now, don't they? As if the cowboy had ever had a sense of honor, but especially after the, the Trump presidency, even anyway, George Bush's presidency laid that fiction to rest. Even the Capitol rioters argued as much, didn't they? And I'm reminded, I guess I'm going off topic a little bit, but I'm reminded of Ronald Reagan quoting Margaret Thatcher in about 1984 that, quote, a little rebellion now and then goes a long way, Reagan said. Sounds good when you say it knowing nobody's going to act on it, but maybe not so much when racist goons storm the halls of Congress or when the other, maybe a Nicaraguan or from any town USA decides to push back. Okay, let me get back on task. Others by imagined inclination are perceived to be aggressive and seek to take advantage and despoil, that's just what they do. This principally includes, but in, is in no way limited to Aboriginal people, Blacks, females, any perceivable admixture thereof. Evidence for this played out in the American West, South, later abroad as American expansion after most of the indigenous lands had been seized, took aim at Mexico from which 49% of Mexico's territory was harvested and the Caribbean and a across the Pacific, uh, across the Pacific is really well detailed in Daniel Immerwar's recent book, How to ha Hide an Empire. Even as early presidents, such as George Washington and Thomas Jefferson sought to limit and restrict pell-mell settler westward expansion, it was a struggle they lost. Uh, in this way, the history of the Republic is probably more Jacksonian than anything else. Craig Grand and, and also Heather Cox Richardson to some extent have argued in recent books. You may recall that it was Jackson that early on Steve Bannon tried to frame and present uh, in the United States as Donald Trump's presidential hero. That's Grandin's book, End of the Myth, by the way, uh, though he takes a more expansive view of its decline than I do in this project. And Heather Cox Richardson has in her stunning new book, How the South Won the Civil War, goes a step further to affair that the Confederacy, the losing on the traditional battlefield in a sense, won the war or at the very least won the peace, at least in part by subsequent political maneuvering and the appeal to old fashioned white supremacy. This is what she frames as the American paradox, a term she borrows from Edmund Morgan where equality for all takes a back seat 
to equality for those roughly akin to, or for whatever reason, enamored of the framers, those white slave owning misogynistic oligarchs and their enablers that she channels his forward down to today. It's quite, as I say, quite a stunning book. Anyway, uh, and I, of course I immediately worry, don't Trump and the Republican Party immediately come to mind? Richardson says yes, by the way, but I'd better get back on track. But first at the very least, and by way of example, we might also consider the racist and the imperialist presidencies that sought to cast their main man as a kind of cowboy, including Indian killer, Long Knife, Andrew Jackson, Indian killing old rough and ready, Zachary Taylor. And you may know in the 19th, this stuns students into disbelief that in the 19th century, you could run for president uh, by building on your reputation as an Indian killer or banished to Oregon territory because of his alcoholism, but later civil war winning Indian fighter, Ulysses S. Grant. Frontier myth-promoting writer, soldier, self-promoter, Theodore Roosevelt, great society architect, Lyndon Johnson, sartorial cowboy, and Puritan channeling Ronald Reagan, Reagan imitating George Bush, and Latino-hating, pussy-grabbing, containment wall-building Donald Trump. I mean, it reaches throughout the American society, I guess is what I'm saying. So this frontier myth is also the beating heart of Manifest Destiny, a term coined in 1845, but dated by scholars to the Puritans who tended to see native people as either A, agents of the devil or B, devils in their own right. The preferred term today is American exceptionalism. I think I've been over some of this territory already now. Manifest Destiny held that America had a divinely inspired right to expand so as to promote and spread Protestantism, American style democracy and capitalism. If it sounds like a frontier myth, that's because it is. As observed by one of the giant figures in mid 20th century American historiography, William Appleman Williams. As an aside, just by the way, when I was uh, started out in graduate school, stories still circulated among the older professors in the history departments about my age now, who had witnessed Williams being shouted down at conferences when he dared to bring up the idea that the United States was, was an empire. Anyway, my point here is that I want to stress the centrality of a culture of white hegemony as having been key to the American experience. These are significant points and of crucial import when reading Westerns and zombie screen narratives. Third, uh, the genres by turn uh, champion and celebrate, explore and exploit the magic of rebirth so reliably that it is often simply assumed. This attribute again is the canvas upon which America expresses itself in a process Richard Slotkin several de decades ago cleverly and thoughtfully termed, uh, as Pauline mentioned, quote, regeneration through violence, end quote. The idea runs something like this, that violence directed at the other may continue to be regenerative long after, in a sense, the, the old fashioned style of engaging in war was over. They can continue to be regenerative because you know, a novel or a film may recapitulate the founding traumatic violence directed at indigenous people and African-Americans. One example, American GIs, like these are kids, 19, 20 years old, but young, young men themselves <clears throat> in Vietnam, imagine themselves as cowboys fighting Indians spontaneously. And then at that point, Turner's essay had been written 70 years before. The frontier, the wild frontier had long since been closed and settled. And yet it's alive enough in popular culture to have these young men thinking that the enemy held by the Viet Cong or the North Vietnamese was Indian country. The territory, this, uh, okay. So this is an idea, by the way, if you're interested, uh, is taken up to great effect in, by Stanley Kubrick in his film, Full Metal Jacket. Regeneration, rebirth, revivification. Take your pick of metaphor. Featuring as protagonist, an American Adam or Jesus, you know, again with the Christian baggage, outfitted appropriately for say Idaho, Texas, Haiti, or perhaps Nicaragua. Avatars, Pandora, or perhaps space more generally as in the final frontier is in Star Trek, the original TV series that was conceived literally as the quote wagon train to the stars. 
By myth, I mean the stories the members of a nation ritually and compulsively tell and retell themselves about themselves that impart meaning to their shared existence. Myth offers the narrative shell and an adhesive that gums the American settler nation together. As you're all, of course, well aware, and as I've mentioned, Benedict Anderson famously made this case decades ago that the nation is, after all, quote, an imagined community, end quote. In this way, members of a nation are all culpable for the promulgation of the stories they share about what they believe to be true and not true, including, quote, scholarship, religion, science, politics, mass media, the workplace, theology, recreation, writes Beverly Stolci. In short, myth provides the stories as well as the language that render a nation intelligible to itself. Myths are, quote, born of the womb of cultural necessity. That's Craig Fitzer again, because no nation can exist without them. Quote, a mythology is a complex of narratives that dramatizes the world vision and historical sense of a people or culture, reducing centuries of experience into a constellation of compelling metaphors. That's Richard Slotkin. Quote, a people cannot coherently function without myth, sums it all up, uh, John Hellman. Oh, and just a word about common sense. Myths are naturalized so as to be indistinct from, or better yet, so as to express common sense. Yet obviously not everybody believes myths in the same way any more than Christians all believe in the same thing or believe it in precisely the same way. Further, a nation, despite the lazy use of the term in the media and by politicians, is not the same as a country. Countries in the Americas consist of a variety of nations which frequently are in competition. This also includes Canada, right? Invariably, however, one nation dominates. But I have to be careful and stay on topic uh, and keep an eye on the clock. So let me simply note that the United States has been dominated, as I mentioned before, by uh, white supremacy since day one. If you're inclined to be more hopeful than I am, I urge you to read Henry Louis Gates, Heather Cox Richardson, Sterling Stuckey, Greg Grandin. There's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of literature out there. And so a nation as community is built upon shared notions, isms swallowed, swaddled in letters and conveyed in emotionally charged narratives. Such tales, quote, imply an built-in audience eager to embrace the ritualistic pleasure of seeing the same story again and again, end quote, according to Megan Sutherland. For example, as with a captivity narrative, which is taken up in the uh, second chapter, uh, when I write about white zombie, uh, it comes up again in chapter six, the Rambo, when I, uh, that explores some of the early Rambo film franchise, the captivity narrative constantly rehashes itself, so too with the zombie film, quote, the remake works in zombie cinema as an element of style and a bare actual meaning that accrues that meaning precisely with repetition, end quote, that's Megan Sutherland again, uh, that's, that's a genre at work after all. Fourth point, operationally, and by this, I mean not simply the way of, uh, by way of practice and policy and the legal network that supports them, such as uh, Indian reservations or slave plantations as examples, but more broadly as well in cultural terms, accessible to us in expressions of popular culture. The genres fixate always and everywhere on containment of the other. Like Trump's wall, the mythical wild frontier serves as a demarcation line or ever shifting buffer zone to keep the others out, at bay, subdued, conquered, or contained. Until such time uh, is the, well, indefinitely, uh, or in historical time, until such time as in, indigenous people were forced onto reserves, African Americans already largely relegated to slavery, or later when nominally freed Jim Crow, which was then extended to the Caribbean basin, as in the case of the invasion and occupation of Haiti from 1915 to 1934, and from whence zombies emerge into American popular culture. Without containment in its partner, annihilation, there would be no United States. For more on this, I would refer you to Gary Clayton Anderson's 2014 study, Ethnic Cleansing, the Crime That Should Haunt America. Meanwhile, 
Zombie screen tales both build on and undermine such traditions by asking first, what happens if or when the other can no longer be contained? What then? In this way, and as a result, zombie screen narratives, in particular after George Romero's seminal 1968 Night of the Living Dead, throw US imperialism back against itself and reconstitute birth as a nightmare. In other words, horror. Again, just consider the typical zombie attributes in no particular order. On screen, they're stupid, cannibalistic, criminal, filthy, sneaky, driven by relentless bodily urges, destructive, slow moving, inured to sentiment and so on. You'll notice, as I mentioned before, these are all the characteristics routinely habitually, not just historically, accorded the racialized American other, most typically represented on screen by stereotyped indigenous people, and especially, especially if we're talking about Westerns, African Americans, Latinos, females, Jews, Asians, even the wrong sorts of Europeans. And now I'm thinking in particular Bella, Bella Lugosi in 1932's White Zombie. By the way, this is widely available uh, to you at Carleton. You can watch it at the Criterion, the, the better version, or just click on it in YouTube. Uh, Bella Lugosi in 1932's White Zombie, whose eyes you may have noticed in a terrific poster promoting this talk today, those eyes belong to a Hungarian American actor, Bella Lugosi, uh, who, by the way, inspired the Count on Sesame Street. <laughs> you remember if you have kids or had kids? Uh, the Count, no less, because he played the original Hollywood Dracula just a few months before White Zombie was released and thereby became an overnight star. It, he also shows up, just by the way, in Plan 9 from Outer Space. Some of you may also know this film, voted the worst film ever made, which made it enormously popular uh, as soon as that happened. It came out in 1959, it's Lugosi's last film role. And in it, he plays a man risen from the dead, but the, it's on a shoestring budget, took forever to make and he died during the filming. So he was replaced, they couldn't afford to reshoot, but for some reason he was wearing a cape. And after the point at which he died, the character who replaced him just walks around like this with a cape in front of his face, so you can't tell. It's not really Bella Lugosi anymore. Anyhow. White Zombie was released on the tail end of widespread nativist reaction to the masses of Eastern European immigrants who poured into the country in the decades prior. Now, the obvious difference here is that a generation later, Hungarian, sorry, Hungarian Americans could merge into melting pot America, uh, whereas, of course, non white hetero male others could not. And certainly in the case of Native Americans, I mean, why should they? They were there first. Meanwhile, you also have the black hatted white cads. Typically, you see this on the, the film poster for the Virginian, uh, the Virginian versus the character Trampus, typically representing corrupt government or the unreborn. These are also themes taken up in many films, I think Dirty Harry films or in Turner's essay as well, who feature prominently as antagonists to the Western heroes cut from that mythical frontier cloth. These may include dirty sheriffs or unscrupulous lawmakers, corrupt or greedy politicians, think Clint Eastwood's Dirty Harry roles. In this way, the zombie genre appears to roughly to be something like the Western turned inside out, flipped, turned against itself, the Western's own cheeky, scary mirror. Zombie stories take perennial rebirth, the mythical promise of mom and apple pie Americana and suffocate it. They, then they resurrect it and throw it back in your face. It's something like that. Fifth and finally, trauma too has been central to these genres, in particular in the sense that threats or perceived threats to the settler culture's dominance must be addressed vigorously on screen as in real life. At the very least, they have to be met, ideally, and not infrequently vanquished or violently subdued. For example, the former case was mostly the path chosen to engage indigenous people because it was their land that was coveted. Whereas in the latter case, since black labor was desired, uh, a variety of state terror, to borrow, borrow Noam Chomsky's phrase, became the norm. I mean, this was quotidian America for centuries, the effects of which, of course, reverberate down to this day. This is how nations were built across the Americas, after all, from Canada 
to Argentina and everywhere in between. America's frontier creation myth both expresses, expressed and expresses, demanded and demands it, and the Western has cheerfully obliged. Put another way, the nation was born in a trauma of war. And here I'm not referring to the war of independence, I mean the settler nation, not the country. That is, America was born in war and raised in the trauma of ongoing war against indigenous people and African Americans, and it has never been able to expunge such traumas imprimatur from the national psyche as ongoing and seemingly never ending uh, military engagements illustrate, according to a variety of scholars from psycho historians to Greg Grandin, or even Richard Slotkin, or say Patricia Limerick. Considered collectively, the real world response to these five commonalities today has a handle, as I mentioned, and that's culture war. That's what I mean by the death of certainty, a phrase I am unabashedly poaching from an undergraduate class, my undergraduate days, a long time ago. Across a political divide, the right and left spar over issues that include and scramble guns, God, abortion, gay rights, race, taxation, gender, the nature and role of government, with the exception of gay rights, where conservative hostility has softened somewhat in a generation, according to opinion polls, the divide now seems more pronounced than ever, at least within living memory. Add to that, that uh, add to that the seemingly everlasting warfare, most recently precipitated by 9-11, but it's always something, isn't it? Plus, there's a relative diminution of the United States in the world stage in the face, uh, in the face of another durable myth termed in foreign policy by Mika Zenko, the myth of the indispensable nation. Finally, the United States, according to the Census Bureau, will be minority white by 2045. These have all been identified as key stressors and threats to perceived white supremacy. So to sum up, horror throws a nation's deepest fears against itself. In this way, zombie screen narratives on the whole explore and assault basic truths that America has held to be dear and universal and even foundational about the nature and the role of the other in the American order of things. Zombie tales may respond with mockery or even humor, naturally with gore and guts and such, and perhaps suggest that traditional Truths such as the Western espouses never really existed in anything more than the thoughts and feelings of the settler majority. Take, for example, George Romero's Night of the Living Dead versus John Wayne's The Green Beret. That's a subject, I think, about chapter five. Mythically, that is to say, not so much in reality. And most assuredly, that has been the case, and uh, most especially with respect to alleged racial and gender differences. Please note, LGBTQ was not part of that frontier American dream, though obviously untold, members of, uh, untold numbers of individuals would have certainly lived and suffered through it. So in this way, where the Western cooed over and comforted and reassessed, uh, re pardon me, reassured the nation, that is the hegemonic nation dominated by imaginary frontiersmen dishing out established certainties like so many totalizing bonbons, while well, zombie tales, if we grant that popular culture and mass media in fact throw the society's fears back against itself, as scholars argue, well, maybe then there's reason to hope that zombies may pave the path to a more progressive and inclusive future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, can you hear me? Has I can. The sound is on. I'm exhausted, but I can hear you. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, good. Well, thank you so much, Mark. You've given us so very much to think about in a, a rich talk that uh, focuses on the frontier myth in the U.S. nation and how that myth took form very much in the Western and the zombie film. Um, to two genres of filmmaking we don't see come together, but you've really compellingly shown us uh, the commonalities between these two, and also shown us how they manifest the frontier myths, central xenophobia, racism, and misogyny uh, throughout these films. Um, I'm going to uh, take questions from the audience, but I think if, if you'll bear with me, I'll start things off uh, with one question. And if you do have questions, please put them into the chat and I'll read the questions out. There are a couple of things in the chat already. 
Um, it struck me listening to you, what a uh, both energizing and, and probably traumatizing moment this must be to think about all of these issues, to be writing or completing this book during COVID, uh, and especially with the events of January 6th. Um, and so I, I guess I just want to start things off by asking you to contextualize how much does this particular historic moment sort of shape some aspects of the argument that you've articulated for us? Well, that's, that's a really good question. And uh, I, I really feel like I'm lucky a little bit in, I mean, not the way the world has gone, but the way events have unfolded and led to a couple of books that have been really influential and helpful to me. Uh, one of which was Greg Grandin's The End of the Myth. Now, Grandin's a pretty well-known American historian. He's one of those guys that writes these big bestsellers. Uh, we all have reason to envy, I suppose. And he argues effectively that the myth is not exclusively, but largely about expansion in those days have just come to an end. It's kind of an indictment of capitalism in a sense too. Growth can't continue exponentially forever. And that book has been, been really important and influential for me. And also Heather Cox Richardson's How the South Won the Civil War. So yeah, events, uh, it's, it's never ending. I mean, the, uh, let me back up slightly, but a number of years ago, so the project came about this way, a number of years ago, our eldest daughter said to me one day, she was a teenager and said, hey, Mark, he interested in watching a zombie television show? And I thought, oh, my teenage daughter wants to do anything with me, yes. So I'm all in. I wasn't that excited about it, but, but I did. And it turned out to be The Walking Dead. And the thing that happens instantly in The Walking Dead is that I, that uh, we're just hot on the heels off a, a book on the about the frontier myth, an American film, and he's a frontiersman caught in a post-apocalyptic American South. So that's what started me along the way. So events keep just throwing more material at me. Yeah, it, this year certainly did throw a lot of material at you for sure. Um, <laughs> I have uh, a question, a, a few comments in the chat as well. And if people want to add questions, um, please plug them into the chat. Um, so lots of thank yous for the talk. Um, and then there is a question from Beth Shepard about uh, a parallel uh, with other kinds of uh, cultural tropes. So this rich parallel that you've drawn, um, she also sees the, the replacement and, and the relationship to the other in the pastoral and in images of the wilderness. And I'm just wondering if you could talk about that. Oh, yeah, well, sure. I, it's, the book is much longer than I could, I could uh, in the introduction too, than I could get through in 50 minutes. Yeah, absolutely, the pastoral and the wilderness is, is, is crucial. Uh, and that comes up again, for example, in uh, film like, as I mentioned earlier, the man who shot Liberty Valance at John Ford's classic, uh, began to turn his back on the frontier myth, which he had promoted throughout much of his career. It's a much more reflective film. And, and the quote used on the PowerPoint is to the effect that it was once a desert, now it's a garden. But it always becomes a garden, irrespective of what the landscape is like. We often associate the wilderness with American West with desert, but a film like Man in the Wilderness, which is taken up in about chapter four, starring the first Dumbledore, Richard Harris, is a man who was, who was left for dead after an encounter with a grizzly bear. He's reborn in a classic wilderness setting. I think it's set roughly in Ohio, early 1800s. I'm not sure if I answered that question correctly, but yeah, she's quite right. There are other themes that can be developed. Right, other, other relations to that. Um, right. The other thing I was thinking about in listening to the talk is how horror genres, uh, and I'm not sure about the zombie genre particularly, but horror genres have been reclaimed in a way. And of course, uh, the great film Get Out, which yeah. I, I have nightmares from these things, so I rarely see them, but I was really moved and, and invigorated by that. Mm -hmm. Is the zombie genre also a form that can be reclaimed, that can be um, used to talk back to the kind of frontier myth that um, 
uh, my sense are usually is, expressed for math? That's an awesome question. My sense is that uh, literate, well-taught students coming out of Carleton should be able to do that, but it takes some work and I'm not sure it's as obvious as it should be. When I start my zombie class, the first thing I show them is a clip from Scooby-Doo Zombie Island and they all get a kick out of it and say, what's that got to do with anything, Professor? And say, well, yeah, but I want you to take that Scooby-Doo zombie and come up with a list of characteristics of the zombie. And they're the same. They don't really change from venue to venue. So uh, yeah, it's everywhere. Yeah. I've lost the thread of the question. Um, well, I was just wondering if films like Get Out, which uh, a, a critical yeah, film, um, it gives us an example of how this genre is being used to attack rather than replicate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. So this is a, the, the thing that, that earned George Romero the label as a cinematic genius. Because when, after the first zombie film, White Zombie is basically just a, captivity narrative, this, this blonde haired, dressed in white all the time, American uh, virginal fiance is zombified by Bella Lugosi. And the film was a big hit in 1932. And after that, the, the zombie genre kind of tanked a little bit, went underground. But when Romero came along in 1968 and produced or released The Night of the Living Dead, it's a real, it's a real attack on American race relations casts an African American male in the central role. Uh, that didn't happen in the 1960s. Now Romero said it was just an accident, but I don't think anybody actually believes that. It takes on uh, Vietnam. There are images of lynchings, people hanging from trees, burning bodies, clearing, uh, clearing it, sweeping clear patrols later on in the film. So he really went at it. And yet the film is, entertaining at the same time. Roger Ebert said that when he saw the film at the Saturday afternoon matinee in 1968, the audience, I don't know if you ever went to the matinee when you were a kid, but we always did. It was a, a raucous event that in those days that the uh, horror movies usually involve somebody wearing a rubber suit climbing out of a lagoon with a you know, big funny rubber head on or something. But he said the film started out in the usual way. The kids are all boys just within moments. It's eerily silent. And the little children be sitting beside him at the theater started weeping. So everything changed with Romero. But his second film, Dawn of the Dead, that came out in 1978, dismissed by many as cheesy and uh, just in your face is, is an all out attack on consumerism. Mm -hmm. and entertaining at the same time. Could revisit him. Now I've got a long question here from Simon Turner. Thank you, Simon, for the question. A and I will probably truncate some of this, but Simon, if you want to turn on your audio, if, if you wish to, you can add in to this. But the, the um, beginning of the question is, could you speak to the anti-colonial, anti-slavery themes of white zombie, uh, particularly as the seminal zombie film? And, and then he goes on at length, but uh, Simon, I might leave the rest of that to you. Simon, are you out there? Yeah, I mean, I, I, some of that was to partially get people up to speed on the plot of White Zombie mm -hmm. um, in that level of being set in Haiti and uh, that, that the zombies that Lugosi creates and controls are his slaves, essentially. That's and if I remember correctly, it's been several years since I've watched the film again, but um, that they are they are also white, at, or at least the majority of those sort of workers are white. And what's already struck me about that film is that they're that the 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 protagonist side of the white characters in their manor house um, are nervous about hearing um, um, these black Haitians performing this sort of ritual outside and the drumming and they and they're told that this is a sort of protection ritual but they feel really uncomfortable with it and there is that kind of cultural clash there but ultimately that is not what they should be afraid of it is this it is well the white zombie okay. and that it's sort of taking these principles of voodoo and how Lugosi 
came to his voodoo skills, we don't know, is that its own sort of colonial appropriation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and it just sort of struck me in terms of your argumentation, like even though White Zombie did fall off the map and, and, and it was Romero who really brought about the zombie um, renaissance, how such a seminal film when we look at film history is actually purporting this message, not in perfect way, and it's it's not the greatest movie, but at the same time, it's it is forwarding this message that is rather disruptive to a cultural norm and is quite anti-slavery. And that versus a sort of West, the, what you're talking about about the Westerns promoting um, culture, like a, a normative American culture. Like, what is this film doing? Yeah, <clears throat> oh, okay. that's a lot. Uh, uh, and so let me just offer a couple of things. Yeah, really good, really good insights. And I think you nailed the film. And that I think that's a general consensus on most folks who write about White Zombie. I mean, it came first, but it's uh, in its way, it's uh, despite the content, it's it's a really well drawn film that speaks to the. Uh, prevailing nativist feeling at the time. So this is why Bela Lugosi with his, you all know the Count from Sesame Street or, or Count Dracula from Dracula, or maybe from this film. They have that strong Euro Eastern European accent. He's, so he's European in the wrong way. There are two kinds of Europeans in the frontier myth usually play out. Those from Northern and Western Europe, they're the good ones and then the further the, the more Catholic or the further East you get, things, things turn, tend to turn sour. So you have two kinds of Europeans in White Zombie. There's Charles Beaumont who owns the mansion at which Neil, these fiancés, Neil and Madeline are to be wed. And then there's uh, this character, his name is Murder. The name is never used, but that's how he's identified in, in the script, Murder Legend. That's Bella Lugosi. And these two characters uh, work together. Beaumont approaches Lugosi and says, effectively, I need this woman. I don't know what I can't, I can't live without her. Help me. And he knows Lugosi has these, these powers. And it's funny because in a way, this, this channel is way ahead to Wade Davis's Serpent in the Rainbow of the 1970s or 1980s and the use of a neurotoxin to send somebody into kind of a zombified state. And so he sets about doing that so that Beaumont can have her for himself. But anyway, the point I wanna make is that, so there are two kinds of, of Europeans, the good European, the bad European. They're both bad compared to Americans, but one is even worse. Uh, a second thing that comes up in the literature on white zombie is exactly that. And anthropologists and sociologists in particular pick up on this theme is that uh, no, I'm no expert on, on voodoo or Haitian religion, or certainly not Eastern, the African, West African traditions from which uh, they were ultimately mashed up in Haiti and elsewhere in the Caribbean. But the general argument runs that the zombie, in a sense, is Black's own worst nightmare. Because in a sense, by, by zombifying a Black person, you can reach beyond the grave. So slavery can reach beyond the grave. So it's ultimately horrifying in that way. And then there's a famous scene where the 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 uh, actual well, the only African Americans except for the guy who's driving the coach at the beginning are these guys pushing around the the, the mill this big big uh, stone and one of them falls to his death and they just keep on moving like la di da no big deal just another African falling to his death. Uh, was there something else I wanted to mention? So yeah, I totally agree. White Zombies is a, it's a it's a it's a terrific film, but it has to be watched carefully because uh, I, you know I think for young folks, especially maybe not in, in inclined to be as critical as the rest of us. That's all we do, basically, isn't it? That uh, a film like that's dangerous because it it, it both reinforces certain racist tropes at the same time is it, it attempts to unpack and undo them. Yeah, definitely. It's, um, it's certainly not a, 
great representation of anything, but I, I was struck in watching it for the first time that um, as I, I sort of just watched it as an interest in Bela Lugosi. Yeah. And when I start watching it and find out it's set in Haiti, I was very concerned about what direction it was going to take in terms of racial stereotypes. And I'm not saying that it doesn't get into that, but it's but I was surprised at where the narrative went. And then there's the, definitely this level of in avoiding um, the sort of demonization of a black voodoo zombie maker, they do support an like the narrative supports a certain other ethnic other. Yeah, yeah, and really. Re sorry, just in Lugosi, yeah. Yeah, a really good point. And and the double horror, of course, is that they're they're enslaving white folks, right? Not just black people. Uh, and the captivity narrative itself is as old as the frontier myth. This idea that I mean, it has its origins in the well, in the sort of ongoing war between Aboriginal people and American settlers and the American military. People frequently were taken in battle. And the captivity narrative emerged from that, that basic story, but the gist of it ran in American popular culture. And these are the days when printing was expensive and uh, captivity narratives, even the ones that were sort of historically accurate were still heavily fictionalized. And the books were apparently so popular that they literally would be read until they fell apart because cheap books didn't come along to the latter part of the 19th century. So the captivity narratives, fictionalized the abduction of uh, white females, girls or women, and dot, 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 you can connect the rest once the, once the, the other gets his, his dirty hands on them. Um, we have, uh, I think, time for one more question. So Susan Burho um, has proposed a question here. There are a couple of questions coming up. Mm -hmm. um, she says, thinking of all this in the middle of a pandemic makes her curious about how more modern zombie narratives may be linked to cultural anxieties about contagion and disease, um, as opposed to Romero zombies or right. 1930s era. Uh, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. There's a rich literature. In fact, I would say most of the literature about zombies is on precisely that topic, uh, anxieties like uh, Consumerism, but Romero did take that up, but he's not the only one. Uh, body image. Uh, a lot of scholars have written about the, what young kids, to, to us, our kids, uh, are subjected to problems with the problems, but issue body image issues and how zombies, in a sense, feed on that. Uh, race and gender, illness from HIV, SARS, pandemic, immigration and refugees, especially after 2001. If you look at the, if you track over time, zombie narratives beginning in 1932 in a graph, there's, starts with white zombie and there's a mild bump of, in interest. And then there's almost nothing, a few films in the 60s, B or C level movies in the 60s and 70s. But then all of a sudden 9-11 goes sky high. And Fascinating. Sorry? And in fact, related to that, um, is it Kat W uh, uh, has interjected that she had the same notion that Susan Burho did um, and notes that there's a film uh, adaptation of the zombie Western video game, The Last, the Last of Us, been announced. I don't know if you've heard about that, Mark. The Last of Us. Um, uh, it has to do with the contagious fungus and disease and yeah, uh, she thinks we're going to hear more of those sort of things. I have heard of it. I have not played it. I own, the reason I know it is that so in my the class, zombie class, the students are expected to come in with material laid on in the course and share it with the class. That because for example, the first time I was taught the class, somebody stopped me at the break and said, "Are we going to discuss Chinese zombies in this class?" And my immediate question is, "There are Chinese zombies too." I mean, I don't know everything about zombies, so. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of material out there, and and growing for sure. Yeah, um, and they keep moving. I, the zombies themselves keep changing, speeding up, getting smart, uh, becoming somewhat democratic, having leaders. For example, in the, the I am uh, the film that Will Smith 
started in 2007. Hmm. So Will Smith plays, now it's really interesting because he's a, a black man playing what is traditionally a white frontiersman role. He looks the part, he acts the part, he's got every reason to play that part. The zombies are white, they're really fast, they're super strong, they're organized, and they, they're clever enough to think again one step ahead of his character. And he plays this, this brilliant scientist. So yeah, it's full of changes. Sorry, Carol, I think. Yeah, yeah. no, that sounds great. Um, I, I realize we've gone sort of over the time. Um, Simon had another, uh, a couple of other points to make about indie uh, Canadian horror films. Blood Quantum is another. So there's a lot of literature oh, out there. Drop what, everything what a rich topic. Drop Go everything ahead. and watch that film this weekend. We just watched it, at, uh, Carmen found it for us a couple of weeks ago. I don't want to give anything away. It's, it's just, it's fantastic. It's, it's thoroughly Canadian, but in a really, in a good way for a change. Right, okay, sounds good. I remember that came out and somehow I missed that one. So um, thank you for that. Um, thank you so much, Mark, for a really enjoyable, innovative um, experience and a romp through history and uh, a really interesting combination of films, TV and so forth. So thank you uh, and thank you to, for uh, the audience for being here and for the great questions. Uh, much appreciated and we look forward to seeing the book. Me too. Thanks, <laughs> Carol, thanks, Pauline, thank you everybody. Thank you.